When you introduce somebody that everybody knows, they always say everything you would have said before you get there. And then there's nothing worse than reading somebody's resume to people who have it sitting in front of them. So I'm going to skip all of that. And I'm going to get straight to it. She is the 32nd Attorney General of California. And she is, let me just. She is the first woman and the first woman of color. But more than that, she is a person who comes to this position with experience. She is a real trial attorney. You know, those of us in this room understand what that means. Somebody who really has tried a case and understands what it takes to prove a case. And we don't see too much of that anymore. People make these decisions in these offices, but they don't really know what it's like to be in the trenches and try a case. But we have somebody here today who can try a case and who cares about the people that are impacted by those cases. So she has improved services for victims, and she isn't so focused on incarceration that she doesn't recognize that we need to put resources toward keeping people out of jail. And that is, that, that is a whole new paradigm that is truly smart on crime. So she is your attorney general. She is a great lawyer. She's an author. She's a real trial lawyer. But more than that, she is a friend. And we are so grateful to have her here today, Kamala Harris. Thank you. Please, please have a seat. Please have a seat. Oh. Thank you, Kim, and for, for your leadership, for your friendship. I could speak for quite some time about everyone on this dais and who you are to me personally, who you are in terms of leadership, who you are in terms of, of, of being an individual who knows how to, to inspire. Um, it is so important in these times that we have leaders among us, and we all, by virtue of being in this room, are leaders in that way, who understand that even though we may in many ways be facing crises, there are opportunities that are present. And these are times that will challenge our commitment to, yes, this concept of civil rights. It will also challenge our commitment to knowing that we can overcome obstacles and stay committed and stay focused on our vision. And I'm so honored to have been asked to speak today at the Clarence Mitchell lunch um, and, and to talk a bit about his work and, and what I see as being the work before us. Uh, many of you know I have so many friends, uh, you know, I just have to point out a few. Robert Harris, I call him, we're both Harris's, he's my cousin, I call him cousin, we've been calling cousins forever. Um, you know, we all, we all, many of us as lawyers in this room have a story behind the reason that we became a lawyer. And I think probably for, for many of us, the story is the same. So for me, it meant that um, I was born as one of two daughters of parents who met when they were actively involved in the civil rights movement as graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s. So that meant my sister and I grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who pretty much spent full time marching and shouting about this thing we call justice. And growing up in that environment, the heroes were the lawyers, the architects of the civil rights movement. And of course, we all know who they were. Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and Constance Baker Motley, who understood the power of the skill of this profession of law to be able to translate the passion from the streets to the courtrooms of our country, to do the work of reminding people who in many cases unfortunately needed to be reminded of that great promise we articulated in 1776 which is, of course, that we are all and should be treated as equals. So at a very young age, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I went on to Howard University. I'm so proud of these HU lawyers and law students. <laughs> it's my bias. Um, and then I came back to California, and I, and I attended Hastings College of the Law. And it was in law school that I made the decision about what I was going to do with my career. And I'll tell you, my family gathered around, as, as many of ours did, you know, okay. And they said, Kamala, what are you going to do in your fight for justice? And I was all excited. And I said, well, I've decided I'm going to be a prosecutor. Well, you know, many thought that was a curious decision. And with some, I had to defend that decision like one with a thesis. But what I said then is what I absolutely maintain today. 
after a career as a prosecutor. Law enforcement has such a profound and direct impact on the most vulnerable among us and has as its responsibility, as its job, to in the process of giving safety also give dignity. So that's why I decided I wanted to do that work. I went out straight from law school to the Alameda County DA's office, which years before had been headed by Earl Warren. And I will tell you as an aside, I was part of the second class to integrate public schools in Berkeley, California. So the fact that I would later be at the office, once led by, of course, the author of Brown v. Board of Education, is, is a symmetry I've always enjoyed. But I grew up with a fundamental belief that when we talk about our fight for justice and civil rights, it is about the fight to make sure that all people have a voice and that in particular, the most vulnerable among us are given a place where they can stand and be heard and be given dignity. So when I look at where we are today as a country, and I think about the issues that we are facing today, in this year of our Lord 2011. I think about just what we all read on the front page of our newspapers. It's about President Obama fighting every day to maintain a country where we can make sure that the poorest of us have health care, where we can make sure that we have a democracy that prioritizes the importance of compromise and understands that the voices of those who may be the meekest among us may be treated and must be treated as those who appear to be the most powerful. I read on the front page of the paper about what we all know, which is that hardworking Americans are losing their homes because they are losing their jobs. We read on the front page of the paper about what we are facing as communities and then as a culture and a civilization when we look at a broken criminal justice system and a broken public education system. We see every day the challenges we are facing as a country and when we come together in the spirit of Clarence Mitchell as the NAACP and as lawyers, what are we then to do and what should we do in terms of prioritization? Well, I've chosen to focus my work on three specific areas among many. And as it relates to each of these issues, I believe that we can see that the impact that these issues are having on society are creating for us an opportunity to recommit ourselves to one of the strongest tools that I believe was evident in the civil rights movement. And that is the tool of coalition building. So what are these issues? Well, let's look at it from the perspective of education. Last year in California alone, 600,000 children, elementary school students, were truant. And where do you think they end up next? They end up being the statistic that tells us that nationally and in California, of all African American and Latino ninth graders, less than half will graduate high school. And when we walk into the county jail or the county emergency room or the county morgue, we see those numbers reflected. I would suggest to you that on this issue of education, there are two communities in particular in this state and in this country who are suffering the most. And it is the African American and Latino communities. Let's look at another issue, the criminal justice system. We all know it needs to be reformed. I praise President Jealous for the report that he has issued talking about what it means to be smart and the need to be smart when it comes to criminal justice policy. And we all know the numbers. We can probably recite them off the top of our head. We know that African American and Latino communities are disproportionately impacted when you look at who is not only incarcerated, but also who is a victim of crime. So let's talk about that fact. Let's talk about the fact that we have an equal stake 
in reforming the criminal justice system in a way that throws away that old simplistic set of choices that tells us you're either tough on crime or you're smart on crime. And we all must instead be asking, are we smart on crime? Not soft or tough, but smart. Which means recognizing that we cannot just react to crime after it occurs. We must be equally committed to preventing crime before it occurs. It means realizing that age-old concept that transcends cultures and religions that tells us about this thing called redemption. What does that tell us? Everyone will make a mistake. And for some, that mistake will rise to the level of being a crime. And yes, there should be accountability and consequence. But is it not a just and civil society that allows folks to earn back their place among us and to be productive and to coexist and be part of our community? We have an absolute stake as the NAACP in making sure that we get smarter on crime. And I believe that we have a natural ally in this discussion. Let's think about another issue, and that's the foreclosure crisis. Okay, so what are we talking about there? Well, we're talking about a bunch of folks we know because we're in this room, we were raised by those folks, who believe and have believed in the American dream. People who believed that if you work hard, sometimes hold down one and two jobs, you go out and you buy a home, you pay your taxes on time, you pay your bills on time, you pay your mortgage on time, and you will have a good life. But what has happened is in the last few years, there have been predators who have come into communities in the form of brokers to financial institutions who have literally been stripping these folks of their few remaining assets and all of their dignity. And this is a crime that should not go without consequence. And I will tell you that of those who have been the victims of this crime, there are at least as of today four million residents of this country who, are, who have been part of that foreclosure crisis. Four million, and let me tell you another fact. Fifty percent of those who are at risk of losing their homes because they are on foreclosure, fifty percent are African American and Latino. Despite the fact that African American and Latino homeowners are only twenty percent of the total. We are in the same situation on one of the most pressing issues that faces us. And we know that as lawyers. We know that when we remember studying in law school, Shelley V. Kramer. Remember that? That 1948 case where the NAACP convinced the United States Supreme Court that restrictive covenants that excluded persons of color were unconstitutional. Chief Justice Vinson said in that decision, and he wrote, equality in homeownership was, quote, an essential precondition to the realization of basic civil rights and liberties. So we know this is not just about losing a house. This is not just about losing a home. It's about losing a community and it's about losing faith in the American dream. And we need to deal with that. We can deal with it as lawyers, and we can deal with it as leaders of our community. And we, in this way, I believe, on those three issues, have a perfect opportunity to recognize that we are living in the same place as our Latino brothers and sisters, and we have an opportunity, if not, I think, 
an issue that compels us to say that we must recommit ourselves to what was the background of everything that allowed me to be the first African-American woman attorney general in the biggest state in this country. And I'll tell you another thing. I know you heard from Antonio Villaraigosa, who was here. Antonio Villaraigosa was elected the first modern-day Latino mayor in the city of Los Angeles. He was elected, and I'm sure he shared with you, by a coalition of African-American and Latino community leaders. I was elected the first African-American Attorney General of California by a coalition of Latino and African-American leaders. And when we look at the background of our history, let's remember that in 1968, as Cesar Chavez was protesting the rights of farm workers to organize, Dr. King sent him a letter. And it read, as brothers in the fight for equality, we are together with you in spirit and in determination that our dreams for a better tomorrow will be realized. And Cesar Chavez reminded us when he wrote the, quote, enemies of justice want you to think of Dr. King as only a civil rights leader, but he had a much broader agenda. He was a tireless crusader for the rights of the poor, for the rights of workers everywhere. And that is the coalition that brought us to where we are today. And so when I think about coalition building, I think about it based on the history. I think about it based on the heroes upon whose shoulders we stand. I think about it based on what we need to do to really maximize the power of our voice. Because we need that fuel. We need our voices to be loud. And on these issues, and so many others, I think we have that opportunity in this moment of seeming crisis. And in particular, for the lawyers in the room, I want to address one issue in closing. And that's the issue of the 14th Amendment. So, the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution together with the 13th and the 15th Amendment when we were fighting civil war. And on one side of the 14th Amendment is the 13th Amendment that put an end to involuntary servitude, slavery. And on the other side of the 14th Amendment is the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. So let's talk about the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution to make sure that no one was denied equal protection under the law. Back then, it was used over and over and over again and advocated as a tool by Clarence Mitchell. It was talked about by Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, and Constance Baker Motley. And right now, there are people who are suggesting the 14th Amendment should be amended. They are suggesting that that main tool that allowed us to have the ability to fight for our rights should be amended. They're suggesting that we should repeal the first sentence of that precious amendment, which basically reads, every person born in the United States is a citizen. You remember why that was in there? Because of something called Dred Scott. And who do you think this amendment of the 14th Amendment is being targeted against? Latinos. We gotta fight. 
We have to fight to preserve the 14th Amendment. We have to fight for everything that is about equality and justice in the day in which we live and have the great blessing to be part of the leadership. We've got a crisis around health care reform. Some would attack it, and we need to fight that down. We need to make sure that our hardworking folks who bought a home can keep their homes. We need to make sure that those black and brown babies are educated. And we need to reform the criminal justice system in a way that embraces the concept of redemption and is truly smart on crime. And I would suggest that we do it in a spirit that recognizes and throws away anybody trying to suggest that this is a zero-sum game. Because it's not. And in the spirit of Clarence Mitchell, who did what he did in creating the leadership conference, understanding the power of pulling together a coalition, I say let's keep marching, let's keep shouting, and let's keep the lawyers in this room walking into those courtrooms using the power of our voice with the skill of our profession. And I thank you all very much.